Mark Delissa. Uh, Mark, as I said, is perhaps best known for his arrangement of Stand By Me for the royal wedding of Harry and Meghan uh, Markle back in 2018, Christian. And uh, Manila Kaur Sikh, uh, devotional Sikh singer, songwriter born in Melbourne, Australia, now living in London. So let's start with, with you, Mark. Our question, our first question is the role of music and faith they're inextricably linked um and as i was saying before even back to gospel days uh when uh, you know song uh, was used as a way of communicating let's talk a little bit about that yeah well music music is one of those things that we were born with right we came out of the womb and we didn't speak we didn't say my goodness it's chilly out here on on our first breath we came out and we cried and that is the basis of singing and so it's inherently within us uh, and as we grow we kind of use different instruments and we get collected with other people and we sing together in choirs and stuff like that and this is why music is so incredibly important what i call a, it's a heightened form of expression our voices can create music they can also articulate word but this heightened heightened form of expression, which is music, is so fundamentally important within our, our, our faith, whatever that faith might be, because we can then say stuff. We used to talk about this when I was growing up, that it's even in your groanings that you can, you can be heard. You know, you can tell a message through an, an ow or a ooh or a e, whatever it might be, you can express yourself without lyric. And so when those two things come together, be it lyric and melody, it's incredibly powerful and therefore superb, a superb way of expressing yourself and expressing your faith. So do you think singing a prayer is more powerful than just saying it? Yes, I do, because it's stimulating all of the senses. Yes, we are hearing the lyric and we're hearing the, the, the content and the text of the prayer. But actually, when you put in a melody, the melody stirs you in a different way. You know, people always talk about uh, listening to music, which, is, which has word and lyric, and then also listening to instrumental music and which one stirs you more. And people will always say that actually the coming together, well, a lot of people that I speak to, the coming together of music and lyric is the thing that stirs you the most. Uh, and so, yes, a, a sung prayer is absolutely so much more powerful for me. Uh, let's come to you, uh, Manila. Uh, with, tell us about what you do with, with singing and, and, you know, prayer. Yes, so I am a Kirtan singer, and Kirtan is Sikh devotional music. So I take passages from the Sikh Holy Scriptures, and I compose music to it. And I release albums and then all the proceeds from my music is donated to educating girls in India. Um, the beautiful thing about Sikh music is that when Guru Nanak came out with this concept of Sikhism in the 15th century, um, there were very, there were caste systems and heavy discrimination towards women. People with certain names weren't allowed to worship God or weren't allowed into temples. But Guru Nanak with Sikhism wanted to equalize this problem. And so he would have these kirtans where people would join together to sing and everyone would be sat at the same level, whether you were a king or a pauper, female or untouchable, this practice established a new tradition and promoted unity instead of separation. So through this, Guru Nanak was created a new tradition of equalizing um, all groups of people, regardless of your background or your, your sex. Um, so there's great importance in this world of Sikhism um, where music is seen as a means to communion with God. And the reason why is because music can pull us out of our analytical mind and into our hearts. Ah, yes. And I, I think that's, Mark, that, that's pretty much what you were saying as well. It does, you, you, singing, and even, would you say even the way you breathe when you, you sing um, is, is, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of almost a meditation. You know, you're using your breath in a very different way from when you're speaking, you know, a prayer or devotion, Mark. Absolutely. And I think that um, people, people get caught up in breath and start to kind of make it a little bit more scientific than they need to. I mean, it is obviously a science and something that we study, but it's important to, to understand that it's the intention behind the breath. It's the intention behind the lyric that is the most powerful thing. Now, if we are singing something that we truly, fully believe, or we want to express to an audience or, or, or whoever might be in front of us, 
that is the most important thing. Once we are true to that intention, then your breathing does exactly what it needs to do to convey that message. And so, yes, you're right. Breathing is absolutely important. It is totally different when we're singing to when we are speaking. Uh, but ultimately, it is purely down, for me, down to the intention. If your intention is true, then your, your expression and that, that delivery of whatever it is you want to say is absolutely spot on and straight to the heart of the people that are listening. Yeah, I'm just thinking of gospel singing and, and, and uh, you know, so many famous singers have come from a gospel singing uh, background. Uh, 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 Manila, is it the same with, with you? I'm guessing you're very well known because of, of your uh, singing. But there, there we see the gospel choir. Um, and, and, you know, it, it does. It moves people in a way that, uh, if, dare I say it, a very dry sermon might not. Would it, and, and Manila, I'm guessing that it would be the same for Sikh music. It moves people in a way that just having the words read would not. Absolutely. I think that's what music does. It is um, a universal language. So sometimes even if you don't understand what's being said, that music or that melody or that voice is speaking to your heart and it helps you to connect to your inner and most divine self and that is something that you can bring out into the world the the more connected you are to yourself the more of that energy and that light you can bring out towards everybody that you interact with and we need that we need a way to address our inner pollution so that we can stop polluting the world in a way if that makes sense yeah yeah no that but does make sense let's talk about the movement that goes with singing um gospel singing i mean it's you, you, some of the gospel footage you get it's almost like i don't know a disco if you like um manila is it the same with <laughs> yeah well it is i mean it moved the music moves you is it the same with seek music is there a dance that goes with uh, you know music that, that's for devotion or are the two very separate no it, it is very separate um with seek music it's not so much about your body moving naturally your body will move your head may sway but it's more about the dance of the soul with the divine so it's very much taking that breath and bringing yourself outside of your five senses and into the heart and into the body so kind of escaping the 3d realm that we live in and moving within into this whole inner world that we rarely um, experience in life because everything is pulling us outwards, pulling our attention outwards. But that is a moment to bring all your attention and your energy into this one place and experience the oneness, yeah. pulling it all back in. But you have caught and you have quarter tones, am I right? I mean, we're talking about very different music. How many tones do you, you, you have, tones that we probably don't hear in gospel music or hymns, for instance. Well, that's Indian classical music. And in, in that world of music, they kind of, you can sing kind of, it's, they call it singing up the stairs and down the stairs. I actually personally have no training. Um, when I was growing up in Melbourne, there were, there was very little access to Kirtan music or Kirtan teachers. So I'm self-taught. I would listen to these cassette tapes and figure out the keys on an instrument known as the harmonium, which is an organ-like small piano, I guess, um, is the best way to describe that. So I lack a lot of training, but um, I make up for it in passion and, and just doing it from the most genuine place I can come from. Could, would, you, would you mind, is it appropriate for me to ask you just to, to sing a little bit so people can understand it, what it is you do? Um, sure. Uh, I mean, there's lots of different things to sing, but uh, I guess I, I could sing the Mool Mantra, which is something that Mool means root. Uh, it brings you back uh, into yourself. I apologize, my head is not covered. Normally we uh, wear a cover on our head when we sing because it reminds us to stay within, but just to um, put something high vibration out there. Ek Omkar Satinam Karta Puruk Nidabho Nidaver Kalamuruk Ajuni Sebang Guru Prasad Japa Ad Sacha Jugad Sacha 
है भी सच नानक होसी भी सच so that's a mantra and we sing it and repeat it over and over again um and when we do so we try to do it 108 times which is the prayer beats oh. that we do are 108 times so we just keep singing it until you no longer need to recite the mantra you become the mantra it's as though your cells are singing it and it's moving through you wow. as from you Wow. Wow. Mark. <laughs> uh, I put Mark on the spot, haven't I? <laughs> Mark, you can see that, the, 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 you know, I felt that. And as you said before, you don't have to understand the words. Let's come to you with Mark, with, with the gospel singing. Maybe you can, can you show us how you would use movement and voice to, to praise? Yeah, I mean, there's there's so many ways that you can do that, you know, and I wish I had my, my piano in front of me because I could absolutely show you. But um, there's so many ways. And I think I think what Terminika has done there is she's she's just highlighted a, a really important thing that the music should be you should be part of you. And I think that's really important. So one of my favorite songs uh, is Amazing Grace, which everybody, I'm sure, most people watching today will probably know. But it's such a beautiful song, and it 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 it, it comes back to what I said originally. If your if your belief and your intention is to convey the the message of that song, in other words, let it live with you first and let it be your story, then it absolutely absolutely moves people. Um, and whilst it's not a fast song, so for for, for me, I wouldn't necessarily dance to to amazing grace unless it was an upbeat version um it is a song that very very much comes from the heart i mean i can absolutely sing that for you because it's one of my all-time yes favorite. give us yes uh, just give us a verse amazing grace how sweet the sound that We started off this discussion with the power of music and faith. Uh, I should have just got you two both to sing and <laughs> it would be argument over because whether you believe or what you believe, you do feel it viscerally, don't you? And I think, you know, we were coming back to, to uh, the Queen's funeral as, as well um, and, and the hymns there. And I guess there'll be people from 500, you know, 500 heads of state. So people will be listening and uh, to languages that they might not understand but i think again as both of you have illustrated with the organ even the surroundings i guess even the surroundings the 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 pomp the circumstance the surroundings you you feel it don't you rather than than just hear it if you're you're open to that whatever your your faith is um now as just before the news i was talking about the fact that prince charles has been very very open about seeing his role as uh, the making or creating a space where faiths can flourish where you know and bringing together all the heads of various faiths that's one of the first things that he's done in his role uh, of king he sees himself he sees britain as a community of communities and he wants to protect the space for faith itself how important do you think that message is i'll start with you monika well i think if we just look a little bit further back at the history of this country um, being Indian myself, between World War I and World War II, four million soldiers came from India to fight for this country. They were Muslims, Sikhs, Hindus, and Christians. And at that time, religion didn't matter. It didn't matter 
you, they were joined by this common cause. And then over time, you see the separation happening based on faith. So I think it was very important um, and a wonderful sentiment for King Charles to come forward and say that he's going to protect this um, and try to bring us together. And I think it's about time that we do come together and see ourselves as humans instead of these segments of different belief systems. Um, I think everybody's just doing their best that they can possibly do, and we need to be a lot more compassionate and kind towards each other. And I hope this is the start. Of Mark, your feelings? Yeah, I totally agree. I think this is a really good step for him. And I think that he has kind of been in the wings of his mother for, for, for many years. You know, he's in his 70s now. And I think he's probably seen that there has started to be very much a division within the country, especially where religion is concerned. And I think this is a really great step to say, right, this is how I'm going to begin uh, my, my kingship, I guess. We're going to say that all religions are respected. And he wants this, this idea of, you know, the community of the community within this country, I think is, is a really brilliant, brilliant step. Um, but my only hope is that he, he absolutely goes goes to the uh, you know to, to to the to the degree that we need him to go to how powerful can he be where it, where it comes to bringing uh, these communities together i really do hope that he can kind of stand by his words and make some real progress like what would you like to see him do what do you think would would help even more bring faiths together well, I think, like Monique has said, there's always re there's always been this division, um, which for, for me, I mean, I've never really understood it at all, really. As a youngster growing up, it's like, you know, everybody believes what they believe, and culturally you have uh, different faiths across the world, but they, they all converge here in this country. So I think there just needs to be, there needs to be more transparency about what he believes is is open and what religious liberty is in this country. What can we do? Can we be fully open with our religious beliefs? Can we be uh, visible without, without, without religious beliefs, without any kind of criticism? I think those are the things that I think really need to happen in this country. Hmm. Monica, do you think many people in Britain understand uh, enough about various faiths? I mean, I would not claim to be anywhere near an expert on Sikhism. I mean, what, what's the, what are the basic principles of, for instance, Sikhism that probably elude most Brits? Um, actually, Sikhism is not a religion. I know it's classified as one, but it's actually a way of life to connecting to your divine self with three basic principles. Sit and meditate every day because that makes you aware of your ego and the pollution you put out into the world. Donate 10% um, of what you earn towards uplifting humanity, to, towards uplifting your communities, um, and uh, uh, live truthfully. So um, whatever means in which you earn money and whatever deeds that you do, do it truthfully without cheating others. And that keeps you connected to your divine self because you are walking the path of truth. It's actually very simple faith. Um, there's reasons why Sikhs don't cut their hair, why you see Sikh men with turbans and beards, and even some women. And that was because uh, during India, during that time, there were religious wars where people were being um, killed because of their faith. And um, in order for the Sikhs not to hide, Guru Gobind Singh Ji uh, asked all the Sikhs to wear turbans, the Sikh men to wear a turban. And he said that if anyone is ever in trouble, they will see the turban and they will know that if I approach that man or woman, they will help me because their guru commands it. And if you don't help someone who needs help and you turn your back on them, you are not my Sikh. And that is the reason why we have the image that we have because we are, this, the turban is a, a symbol of safety, of harbor from danger. And to approach a Sikh and ask for help, it is their duty to help you as per um, the Sikh faith. So it has great depth and meaning, which is why that um, wearing the turban and keeping our hair is very important. Scientifically, actually, keeping your hair is also very important, but that's, that might be too long to explain here um, what it does to your yeah. health when, when you cut your hair, but there's, there's many reasons. I think what really needs to happen... Because, uh, uh, 
Well, I was going sorry. to say, sorry, I was going to say one of the reasons that I asked you is because definitely in the United States, where I'd say there's even greater ignorance when it comes to various faiths. So I think England or oh, Britain is so squished in together, we tend to live closer to people from different faiths and different backgrounds. Um, but after 9-11, um, many Sikh uh, cab drivers were being attacked because people thought they were Muslim. I mean, the concept of, of you know, seeing all Muslims as, as terrorists, for instance, is that's a whole different argument about, uh, you know, about ignorance. But, you know, there are still people who uh, confuse a turban with, you know, any head covering denotes x y or z so that's why i'm asking i mean do you think there needs to be more education general education um you know uh, uh, about different faiths just not not even in depth just basic stuff to stop the sort of ignorance i've described that's exactly it i mean the problem is it's it's it starts down deep in the roots but if we go to the schools mm -hmm. and we start when children are young we start explaining to them and teaching them about other faiths and the respect that's required. I mean, whatever faith you are, if you call yourself a Christian, then part of being a Christian is, is love. So you can't go and discriminate other people and other faiths if you call yourself a Christian. So understand what it means to be a Christian. Same with Islam. If you call yourself a, a Muslim, the base of that faith is love. If you are bombing people or attacking people or, or discriminating against other people, then you're not Muslim. You are a person who, are, who is taking what you want from faith, applying it how you want without actually practicing that faith and using the label of that faith to hide your, I guess, awfulness um, instead of yeah, to doing yeah. the and there's a lot of people... Look Exactly. A lot of people from a lot of different faiths uh, or claim to be of a lot of different faiths. I think that claim to be uh, do things, terrible things, pin faith to it and give faith a really bad name. Both of you, I, I, I'm really pleased to say you've done exactly the opposite, enlightened us, uh, you, you know, shared your beautiful voices and, and your thoughts with us today. I really, really do thank you. And I do hope you'll uh, join our faith panel again, because I think any enlightenment, you know, when we talk about these things, it's exactly as both of you have said, then uh, we hopefully start getting people uh, to look at the similarities that we have rather than the differences. Uh, Mark Delissa there um, as Christian celebrity voice coach and Monika Kaur, who gives 100% of everything she earns from her singing uh, to help uh, young women in India. Um, both of them uh, a delight to have on our faith panel.